All that noise. Thank you. Sorry to hold folks up. I always appreciate a response when it's There you go. I did have lunch. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure. Yes, I'm well fed. I'm just waiting on um, your document to come together. I had to edit it a bit because it was quite long. Mm -hmm. And I know they like these introductions to be pithy and spiffy. <laughs> um, so while this is loading, I realized that um, First, I'm, I'm really pleased to, to offer this introduction, so thank you for the invitation to do so, James. I realized that the um, first occasion of our correspondence was in 2022 when James sent me a piece that he had written about uh, MF Doom's early ensemble career um, in which he graciously cited me. And then we met in the flesh last year in New Orleans at the American Studies Association Conference where I was president. And both of those are just examples for younger scholars to take initiative and to reach out to people, send people your work, meet people when you have that opportunity in person because you never know when your paths will cross again. So I'm really happy to have this opportunity. And it's lovely to be able to build on these uh, brief encounters by hearing your latest work, James. A cultural historian, writer, and curator from London, James McNally is a current Nasir Jones hip hop fellow here at the Hutchins Center. Jo James has held a uh, Marie Curie fellowship at University College Cork in Ireland, where he was affiliated with the C Cypher Hip Hop Initiative and has been a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Music at the University of Bristol. James's broad catalog focuses on the histories of hip hop, race, and place, as well as cultural studies of the British variety, my favorite kind. He is particularly interested in how black musicians historically have created spaces of liberation and self-determination through their creative practice, another of our many intersections. He comes to this study after a healthy turn as a rap critic. For 10 years during the early aughts, he was staff writer at Europe's leading rap monthly, Hip Hop Connection, where his hundreds of interviews included figures such as Outkast, MF Doom, Public Enemy, Kanye West, Timbaland, Tricky, Young Jeezy, Snoop Dogg, Wu-Tang Clan, and De La Soul. He has produced radio documentaries for the BBC and co-curated the first major museum exhibit on the history of hip hop in the UK. In 2020, 2021, James co-ideated two series of Spotify Studios award-winning UK rap album analysis podcast, Decode. And in 2021, the first series that he worked on was recognized with two British podcast award golds and two Radio Academy ARIA gold medals. He has now set his sights on academic work, and I'll say for better or for worse, and I wonder in which camp you'd identify today. He has written for the Journal of Popular Music Studies, Journal of the Society of American Music, Global Hip Hop Studies, and Visual Culture in Britain. His PhD research was accomplished as an AHRC doctoral scholar at the University of East London, where he explored the arrival of hip hop in London during the early 1980s. This research argues that for a substantial black-led cohort of polycultural Londoners, hip hop emerged as a new site of futurity conviviality and fugitive identity, and opened up possibilities that yielded a long line of UK black sonic innovation. The book is currently under contract with Rutledge and will be published as Future Shock London in 2025. His current project from which he'll speak today is provisionally titled The Long Island Rap Renaissance, Hip Hop and Black Suburbia in Post-Civil Rights New York and seeks to unearth a social and cultural history that has, for the most part, remained hidden in plain sight from hip hop history. Please join me in welcoming James McNally. Well, that was an absolute honor to be um, introduced by one of my favorite scholars in such an enthusiastic manner. Um, so thank you, first of all, Dr. Redmond, that was amazing. 
Um, thank you also to everyone at the Hutchins Center for having me here and for the great honor of being a NARS Fellow this year. Um, so what I'm going to do today is um, people might have noticed that I've been kind of furiously writing for the last couple of weeks, just um, trying to get something on the table. So I've used this as an excuse to, to try and start writing like a part of my book or part of the project, basically. So I'm going to more or less read for you today. And it's kind of contextually within the larger parameters of the project, which, you know, as Dr. Redmond just said, is um, trying to kind of create a cultural history of hip hop from Long Island's impact on the de development of rap in the 1980s. You mean you're not um, going to rap it? I'm not going to rap it, no, not today. <laughs> if you can human beatbox. <laughs> I know it's disappointing, right? Um, so I shall um, get my slides up. Um, I should. I should also say I started the, the research part of this project in um, a University College Cork in Ireland. So I also have to thank the European Commission for their generous funding of my, um, my uh, fellowship in Ireland. Okay, so here we go. It's a Monday night in 1983, Garden City, Long Island. The location, Adelphi University a $5,000 a year liberal arts institution where according to the marketing literature, the advantages of a major university and a small college meet. Up on the third floor of the university center is Bill Stephanie, a charismatic junior who, is, who, who his friend Carlton Reidenhauer believes can do everything. Stephanie was spelling bee champion in middle school. At high school, he was captain of the bowling team he was in band National Honor Society and just missed being valedictorian by about 0.7. In 1980, when he was voted best all-round senior at Hempstead High School, an almost entirely black school a couple of miles from Garden City, this Reaganite ideal of a white town, Stephanie was pictured in his yearbook dressed in pro-ked sneakers and ink-black rigid jeans. In the photo, he appears the very image of affable confidence but you might be forgiven for thinking him a fish out of geographic water. An unambiguous devotee of a nascent inner city hip hop style in a county seen as America's prototypical white suburban landscape. Yet in 1978, hip hop had swept from the inner boroughs into a handful of black Nassau County high schools along the archipelago of tiny black communities that crest the county's south shore. Quote, we're walking around with the boomboxes playing those tapes of Grandmaster Flash and everybody pretty much at the same time as it's happening, except we're in Hempstead, we're in Roosevelt, we're in Uniondale. So it's the culture of the Bronx, of youth Bronx in Harlem, late 1970s, only with resources. Now, four years later, that culture has embedded itself in Nassau County, and Stephanie, through serendipity as much as design, has found himself at the center of a suburban hip hop brain trust. A, commu sorry, a communication major with an announcer's voice, Stephanie came to Adelphi on a full ride four year scholarship. That was the first of his sliding doors. Now in junior year, he's been installed as program director of the college radio station, WBAUFM. And this is where he presently is, cassette in hand. Stephanie is surrounded by ring binders, band posters, and scrawled notes to the station's DJs and is responsible for programming what the student paper reports him saying as calling the most varied type of music program in New York, from new wave to urban country. Yet this will not be its significance. By early summer 1983, though certainly nobody yet thinks of it like this, WBAU is becoming a petri dish for hip hop's most radical futures. A de facto black creative freedom lab right here in Garden City, Long Island's emblematic patrician white suburb, and it's most notoriously excluding. The catalyst for this is the Monday night radio show Stephanie started at the beginning of the school year, naming it the Mr. Bill Show in homage to a Saturday Night Live claymation. As the Delphian reported this, hip hop bebop is the category that his music falls into. It can be, his it can be anything from original rap 
instrumental mix to contemporary rock and soul, his choice of music is a reflection on the varying tastes within some Long Island communities, Hempstead, Roosevelt, Freeport, New Hyde Park, just to name a few. Some Long Island communities, of course, has a racially coded meaning. In the euphemisms of Nassau County circa 1983, when black people amount to just 7% of the population and are still overwhelmingly concentrated in the same nine places Nassau's black population was concentrated in 1963, some Long Island communities unambiguously means black Nassau County. It means those tiny villages that dot the route to the South Shore, largely isolated, sorry, <laughs> largely isolated from their white neighbours and by comparison disinvested, and it more precisely means the same microgenerational cohort that was absorbed in the same cultural switchover that occurred in Stephanie's high school in 1978. Now that he's Mr. Bill, these same people dotted around neighbouring communities, many of them having spent the intervening years travelling to record stores in Queens and Manhattan, have begun to find their way to him. Gravitate would be too intentional as a word here. Somehow, very quickly, a humour-filled salon has emerged around Stephanie. By all accounts, it's strafed by turn with comedic buckshots, jokes flying thick and fast, and by deep conversation about hip-hop as pure futurity. Here, a domino run of chance encounters has accumulated a talented cluster who view themselves as iconoclasts, outsiders and mappers of new ideas. They can thank the, ser the serendipity of bus stops, student parties, animation classes and friends of friends, and most of them, children as they are, a space in suburban interiority, share what Stephanie's friend Harry Allen will later call the upwardly mobile trajectories of Nassau's black middle class. This becomes like a cultural accelerator. There's Carlton Reidenhauer, a senior in graphic design from Roosevelt, whom Stephanie met on the shuttle bus to Hempstead when Reidenhauer was on his way to the, to the N41. That's the bus that provides the key artery between black South Shore communities and has become a necessary and often joyously noisy mode of transport for local hip hoppers. Stephanie had only decided to speak to Reidenhauer when he saw that he was wearing a Spectrum, Spectrum jacket. That's the sound system Reidenhauer belongs to as an MC, again, almost by happenstance. Both Spectrum's owner, Hank Boxley, also from Roosevelt, and his younger brother, Keith, neither of whom are students at Adelphi, but both of whom DJ regularly at college parties, came in via Reidenhauer. And they're now also doing mixes for Stephanie and producing demos in a space at the back of a dental studio in Hempstead. Then there are others, including Andre Young from Westbury, who DJs as Dr. Dre, and Harry Allen, who's a, a communications major from Freeport. Sometimes they're joined by an MC called Butch Cassidy and by a rap trio from Freeport, who go by the name of Townhouse 3. And soon the Townhouse 3 will introduce everyone to their childhood friend Rico Drayton, who goes by the name of MC DJ Flavor. Harry Allen later recorded of their mapping of hip hop's new possibilities. Quote, it was like we had discovered quantum theory and we were just talking about all the things quantum theory would lead to and all the things it would make possible and all the ways we could understand the universe. Meanwhile, everyone outside is burning coal. That's really the way it felt. We just saw it as an un unlimited tableau, a field of unlimited possibilities, and I wasn't getting that anywhere else. Outside of that, the conversation was just like, what's all this rap music? Is that stuff going to last? That was the level of conversation. Inside the lab, we're having laboratory conversations. I was talking to fellow scientists. Stephanie, like many of his peers, who would help shape hip-hop later in the decade, had not grown up in the inner city. Rather, he was a child of the black suburbanization that saw Nassau County's black population double between 1965 and 1980. His family, like many of those same peers, was part of the broad but ultimately often fragile post-1960 emergence of what Bart Landry called the new black middle class. Ted Stephanie, his father, was particularly illustrious in this respect, 
a so-called swimmer in corporate America, he joined the mailroom of Sports Illustrated in 1954 and worked his way up to become the magazine's first black executive. In doing so, he created a life that interfaced with black stars like Jim Brown and Muhammad Ali. And by 1965, he had moved his family from the Bronx to Long Island, where Stephanie grew up in a split-level home in Hempstead with a garage built into the foundations. Stephanie's father might have been an outlier for the perceived glamour of his work and the degree of financial stability he was able to achieve. But this broader demographic shift aggregated many thousands of individual stories of destinies remade. In a period marked by civil rights gains, by expansions in government jobs, by new technologies and by improvements in pay, a substantial minority of black Americans were able to improve their lot during the 1960s. With hip-hop's origins so clearly and rightly accounted as a product of New York's challenged inner cities, it might be hard to imagine that New York's children of black social mobility could also have been a hotbed for hip-hop's development. When we think of hip -hop, the hip-hop movement's origins, we typically think of the places like the Bronx River houses or Soundview houses, vast public apartment complexes on the front line of dram dramatic public spending cuts. We think of the urban crisis. We think of collapsing tax bases and white flights over the Throg's Next Bridge. That's to say, we think of 45% poverty. We certainly don't think of people with stories like Bill Stephanie's, and neither do we think of the children of postal workers, teachers and nurses, the suburban kids with resources Stephanie describes being magnetised by hip-hop in 1979. Indeed, if hip-hop's origin myths often seem to hinge on, rom on the romantic outlaw narrative of turntables stolen in the 1977 blackout, or of those turntables somehow being comp compensatory for school band programmes that were cut to the bone, Long Island hip-hop's origin stories are distinctly more ordinary. For one, as Stephanie's friend Carlton Reidenhauer remembers, Nassau County's blackout lasted for just a few minutes. And there's something possibly more difficult to square with hip-hop's common sense histories here too. The idea Stephanie proposes of the spoiled kids, his words, as a public good, who, quote, if they wanted to get their own turntables, they were getting them. In 1979, in the wake of those first party cassettes arriving from the Bronx, he describes ordinary middle-class black households with the paraphernalia of the church or of hobbyist jazz careers as the locations for nascent hip-hop activity. Quote, Upstairs, mum had a piano because she could play piano for church and dad was probably a jazz drummer like my dad was, so he had a drum kit. Those started to get shoved to the side because now Calvin Jr. has two turntables and a mixer and a crate full of records. That's happening all throughout these towns. And you, as part of a crew, or just because you're friends with Calvin because he sits next to you in trigonometry, you're going over to his house to hear him DJ. <laughs> Hip-hop's historiography doesn't teach us to think about families. It doesn't teach us to think about the value of nurture. It doesn't teach us to consider that young black people might go to university. And nor does it teach us to think about the ordinary cultural resources of middle-class life. Or indeed, of the sometimes less dramatic yet nevertheless real challenges that young black people and their families faced in places like Nassau County during the 1970s and 80s. And yet in the 10 years to 1970, when hip-hop's early generations were growing up, the number of black Americans defined as middle class doubled to 27%. Landry described a class spanning government workers, educators, doctors, salespeople, entrepreneurs, clerical workers, and others, who in many cases were, quote, recruited from the sons and daughters of garbage collectors, assembly line workers, domestics, waiters, taxi cab drivers, and farmers. By the 1980s, it was estimated that about 80% of the black middle class were first generation. At the same time as Landry's conventionally conceived middle class was expanding, there were also cohorts of black Americans who, against the trends of deindustrialization, de were moving up through highly skilled manual work, or as tradespeople, and in many cases too, these were families that lived in the same neighbourhoods and were able to create the cultural and economic resources more traditionally associated with being middle class. 
So why shouldn't, I ask, the innovators of hip-hop also have been drawn from this upwardly mobile new frontier of black life? And here I'm going to take a sip of my water. <laughs> In New York, this social mobility had come with the opening up of new suburban frontiers of black life. As the urban crisis ate into the infrastructures of places like Harlem, the South Bronx, and East New York, slum clearance programs have put paradoxical strains on the urban fabric, and a substantial part of that emerging class, like their white contemporaries, decided to seek their futures in suburbia. In New York, some moved north through the Bronx into Westchester County, or into a black belt of relatively affluent towns in New Jersey. But from the mid-1960s, a wave of black in-migration to Nassau County and to the western sections of Suffolk County more than doubled Long Island's black population by 1980. In 1960, Nassau County had had a black population of just 39,000 people. By 1970, that was 65,000, and by 1980, it was 90,000. If this sounds like a drop in the ocean, of a 453-square-mile suburban county with a population of 1.3 million, that's because it was. Yet that growth was so spatially concentrated that it was able to generate a new sense of suburban black placeness that existed beyond the measure of the 7% of the population it truly represented. Stephanie himself recalls that his family initially had searched for a home in affluent white East Meadow in 1965, but he says, quote, they were racially steered to Hempstead where, you know, African-American families were being redirected by real estate companies. What year is that ad? That ad is about 1967. Um, and it was at the interface of institutionally racist real estate practices, the structural peculiar peculiarities of zoning boundaries, and artificially stoked racial anxieties, in other words, white flight, that Nassau's black population growth came to be concentrated only in neighbourhoods with pre-existing black presences. By 1981, Newsday reported, more than 80% of the growth in Nassau's black population was limited to a cluster of communities that bisects the centre of the town of Hempstead in an irregular crescent, spilling over into a section of North Hempstead and a corner of Oyster Bay. The seven adjoining communities <laughs> now account for more than 70% of the county's black population. Together, Hempstead, Roosevelt and Freeport, and that's like the absolute kind of ground central for Nassau County hip hop. Um, together, those towns account for 52.2% of the county's 90,000 blacks, even though they have only 7.1% of the county's 1.3 million people. So this is like really, really a very concentrated kind of um, population here. This meant that when Stephanie and his peers at Delphi and before them at Hempstead High entered their adolescences in the 1970s, they did so in a unique cultural environment in the scheme of New York. Black immigration to the county had created an archipelago of small communities that existed as de facto islands of black life in a normatively white sea of American dream. Perhaps they weren't all quite the black main streets it's sometimes tempting to read into the census data with their above median incomes across almost every range. But here, some of the economic inequalities faced by black America were partly overcome in the context of small family-led communities which were civically and artistically engaged where families spanned the gamut of American economic life and a full range of occupation types were largely in proportion to the average white community in the nation as a whole. <coughs> Yet crucially, the families in these communities were still black people in America. They still, that is, lived under the broken covenant that the writer Ellis Coase describes America's black middle class laboring under. They could never rely on the supposition that, quote, if you work hard, get a good education and play by the rules, you will be allowed to advance and achieve to the limits of your ability. And by the same measure, these communities, which in many cases had begun the 1960s as, mod as modestly middle-class places on the edge of rurality, were never allowed to be the same uncomplicated middle-class environments their neighbouring white communities often were. 
For all their relative affluence, communities like Roosevelt and Hempstead had poverty rates that were up to five times those of their closest white neighbours, and yet many multiples yet less than in inner city areas such as Morrisania or East New York. They often had zoning boundaries that excluded concentrations of profitable commercial real estate, and so individual homeowners were faced with disproportionately high property tax burdens that could make being black and middle class a precarious position indeed. And consequently, many communities had straining public services and school districts and unusually protracted conflicts over school budgets. In a community like Roosevelt, Newsday assessed in 1981, the result of this was a complexity that what, whereby one could find houses with two Jaguars in the driveway abutted by others bearing all the visual signs of poverty. And there was typically no spatial rhyme or reason as to what existed where. In Hempstead, they continued, affluent black professionals in homes surrounded by manicured lawns on tree-shaded streets live within a block or two of welfare clients crowded into grimy apartment houses with boarded up windows. Perhaps the moralizing descriptions of poverty they painted in their colorful descriptions were sometimes too much, but the journalistic conclusion was a fair one. Nassau County's black communities were not in any uncomplicated way what we think of when we think of mythic suburbia. Later in the decade, Stephanie's collaborator at Adelphi, Hank Boxley, who grew up in Roosevelt in a home that had been wired for sound by his tinkerer father, would alight on a wrenching take on the broken covenant his parents' generation was sold. Quote, you don't even really understand living in Long Island until you grow up living in Long Island. L living in Long Island is like a fantasy. You're talking about moving from Harlem into a place where you have your own house that you can own. That's like a monumental achievement for people, especially back in the 60s. If you moved to Queens, you were considered middle class. If you moved to Long Island, they're thinking, well, you must be rich. That's why I had to go back to st saying that you don't really understand Long Island in until you grow up. Because you'll find that you're not rich, you're not middle class, you're working class. As the 1973 headline put it, for blacks, only a piece of the dream. Now I have another sip. I'm going to do every, that every time there's like three stars on my um, piece of paper. As a historian, I'm interested in the way particular places at particular historical conjunctures generate the circumstances for unusually vital cultural production. I like to try to understand, because that's all we're doing really, interpreting how places and people and the resources they have at hand, the cultural flows they create, and the obstacles and blockages they face, the way groups of human beings imaginatively engage with the world and seek their freedom and fulfillment. I try to get at how all this stuff creates opportunities for new and interesting things to happen. And I think Long Island's post-civil rights black communities with their unique social character were clearly an example of places where just a crazy amount of originality was created by the first generation of New York City transplants to grow up there. From Rakim and De La Soul to, De La, to Public Enemy and EPMD, these were all acts that had fundamental impacts on how hip-hop could sound and express new things during arguably the music's most vital period of development. And I think it's clear that one of the things that post-civil rights suburbanization did was it created a black inner New York diaspora which put people from all the boroughs in these tiny communities, and that created a petri dish of perspectives and links to the city in a context that was somewhat well-resourced, which was musically and culturally highly engaged, where children generally were nurtured, and which provided physical and psychological space. The kids that grew up here were in a historically unique position. They're growing up on the front line of new black life on the edge of almost rurality, they have physical space and interior space. They're working out what it means to be simultaneously so connected to New York and yet so distant from it. So they have this perspective on hip hop as it emerges where it's both something that's exciting and exotic 
and distant enough to be reimagined, and yet at the same time they feel a generational, racial and regional ownership of it, frequently via relatives who are still in the thick of the neighbourhoods the music emerged from. And at the same time, this is an environment that might predispose them to what you can think of as a suburban black double consciousness. They're caught between two competing misreadings of their situation. From the perspective of the inner city, they're variously seen as country, soft or rich. And from the other end of the telescope, they're being consistently misrepresented in surrounding white communities and by various news media as belonging to a nascent racialized ghetto in the very heart of suburbia. So in a very real sense, they're made to feel like the other within. It's quite a betwixt and between. But I wonder if this created a Du Boisian special kind of perception that partly also ultimately manifested in the creation of highly original art. We return to the third floor of Adelphi University, but to su suffice to say, the big spoiler here is that I'm talking about people who within a few short years would become the rap group Public Enemy. And those of you who don't know, Public Enemy, perhaps more than anyone, created, created a generational shift in hip hop during the late 80s, a really multi-layered shift, which it's hard to even summarize. At the level of Sonics, the Boxley brothers, who came to be the Shockleys in their production career, reinvented the whole sound of sample-based hip hop. They, they created this invigorating wall of noise, which is inherently musical, with a just astonishing amount of invention and vigorous craft. Intellectually, it's kind of like the free jazz of hip hop. And, the tra and this sound travels around the world and it kind of creates all these potentials for kind of new genres in different countries and cities. On the level of MCing, from Carlton Reidenhauer, you get to Chuck D. I think early on, Russell Simmons gets to a key truth of Chuck when he describes him as like the Paul Robeson of hip hop due to his incredible voice and presence. And Chuck and Public Enemy set about exposing the dialectics of his conjuncture from the viewpoint of a youngish black man in America. His influence as an MC, his authority, his command of rhythm, and his musicality with the timbre of his voice is vast. He becomes synonymous, basically, with what a politi politicized rapper should sound like. And then we're getting to the group's political influence. Public Enemy really create this generational rupture in hip hop. They introduced the hip hop in a concerted way, the explicit influence of black consciousness movements. And in this, they're consistently misread as being the voice of the inner city. Yet they're totally children of their suburban environment. They're responding to the black consciousness summer programs their artistically and civically engaged parents sent them on as children. Things that are coming out of Nassau County activist communities in the early 1970s. And they're also children of black studies, which they're being exposed to in a somewhat concerted way at Adelphi. In this moment, they have met the mentorship of a jazz drummer called Andre Strober, who's teaching philosoph philosophical approaches to black music at Adelphi. There's an active black student union that they're in the vicinity of. And in 1983, this is already filtering into what Stephanie and everyone are doing at WBAU. They're producing black news segments from a post-colonial perspective called First World News. And they're also on campus, on a campus where people like Gil Scott Heron, The Last Poets and Angela Davis are all coming in to talk and perform. So by the time Public Enemy happen, they've generated this initially intellectual question in their little think tank of what happens when you take Run DMC and smash it together with The Clash, who were Punk's political powerhouse group at that particular time. And they, then they kind of somehow actually make that happen. Then they're taking all these influences and sending them all over the world, and that impacts young black hip-hop generation people everywhere, and also many young white people like myself for whom this was intellectually and politically generative. I think the way their environment has generated that kind of suburban black double consciousness is critical here. They're middle class and they have some of the benefits that accrue to middle classness. They're viewed from their inner city like they're rich, which they're definitely not. 
and at the same time they've grown up in an environment that frequently reminds them of the second classness of their middle classness. And then specifically when they go into Adelphi, they're daily in an environment that Harry Allen later describes as poisonously white. And that's not on some I hate white people kind of tip. This is a town where the deputy chief of police repeatedly talks about racially profiling black people as if that's a public virtue. And I'm absolutely not exaggerating here. There's like a, you know, at least three or four news articles that I found where he literally says that. I have a long piece of writing on this and through it you kind of get to understand why very early on in his career Chuck D would be saying quote, it's apartheid like a motherfucker out here. <laughs> then he goes on to say, one thing about Long Island is it has given me the opportunity to look up close, sorry, to look at up close white America and its beliefs and fears. I've been stopped by police for walking through Garden City coming from Adelphi to the bus stop. I get mad sometimes when I get stopped by police because I'm riding in a loud Jeep. They think I'm a drug dealer. They say I look like that type. It's insecurity and lack of knowledge that breeds racism. But I refuse to be a victim because a victim is a loser. You know, it's just like incredible. This is like the most, um, the, the least likely to be a criminal guy in, on the planet, pretty much. He's so, like this really, really kind of intellectually engaged kind of middle class kid who just wants to be an artist, basically. He wants to be like a comic book artist or a graphic designer. And he's going to the, this university, you know, that he's gotten into and... You know, he, this, and this is something that apparently was like happening to black students at Adelphi really frequently, which you know, is just kind of horrifying. So in a very direct sense, this is the place where these young people, who every single one of them is brilliant and who have done exactly what society tells them they should do, find themselves in the crosshairs of the public enemy logo, so to speak. So the public enemy logo is like a silhouette of a kind of homeboy figure with a crosshairs across it. And it symbolizes the black, kind of young black man in America being public enemy number one. So this is Adelphi is where they write public enemy number one, which is about being construed as a, a, an enemy within America. And this is ultimately the place where they become public enemy and not run DMC part two. So it's a completely a, a misreading to see them as these kind of representatives of the inner city, although they're like obviously talking to inner city issues as well. The, the fundamental core of who they are and what their project is, is from this kind of, this really kind of segregated environment that, that they grew up in Long Island. And now I've got three more dots, so... <laughs> Okay, so during 1983, this nascent hip-hop community began to record and broadcast original music. Reidenhauer, who was now going by the name Chucky e. D, later suggested this had been almost an afterthought. Quote, we wanted to make tapes for the radio station to advertise that we played rap when other people didn't. For Stephanie, the sudden flourishing of new music directed at the station had just as much to do, though, with an existing void in the representation of black life in Nassau County. The show had quickly become a magnet for local rap crew's creativity, and Stephanie began to receive what he describes as homages not to me, but really to the show, and I think, it, I think also to the concept and prospect of Black Long Island, Nassau County, having its own radio station. WBA, WBAU was something local that they could relate to, and I think they were just so passionate about having something so close that they'd go into either their basements or bedrooms and create tapes for us. It's hard to quantify just how important this would be for rap's later development and for Long Island's coming centrality in the genre's so-called golden age. From this zone of suburban black invisibility, WBAU was able to hang creatively with the, with inner New York's rap radio pioneers in a moment that was suffused by broadcasting invention. 
If this was a source of affirmation and pride for Nassau's nascent hip-hop scene, it was also, more practically, an engine for serendipity and the confident transmission of the idea of Nassau County hip-hop as a legitimate creative force. What happened at WBAU in the mid-1980s would, in no uncertain terms, shape how the rest of the world experienced hip-hop in the late 1980s. WBAU was where the transformative DJ producers Hank and Keith Shockley first produced their own music and began to explore the signature, their signature sonic tropes. It was where Andre Dr. Dre Young of Original Concept, a key pioneer of hip-hop's ubiquitous detuned Roland TR-808 bass kick sound, and later one of the triumvirate of Yo! TV Raps presenters, began his career as a broadcast personality and made prototypes for influential recordings, including Original Concepts' Knowledge Me. It was where Public Enemy's Flavor Flav hosted the MC DJ Flavor Show and auto-fabulated his already obviously abundant star quality into compelling solo recordings like You're Gonna Need Me and other less enduring ones like Party In My Pants. <laughs> and it was where Stephanie himself would serve his apprenticeship as a connector of people, ideas and sounds, leading to the tenure at hip-hop's most influential label, Def Jam Recordings, which would see him briefly become the company's president by decade's end during the label's most for forceful period of cultural influence. And then there was Carlton Reidenhauer as he, as he felt his way from be, 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 sorry, as he felt his way from becoming Chuck D via, to, let me um, back up on that sentence. Um, and then there was Carlton Reidenhauer as he felt his way to becoming Chuck D via Chucky D. Once Stephanie presses, presses play on his cassette, MC Chucky D is soon encouraging listeners across the Long Island airwaves to dance. If they do, he promises, voice like Paul Robeson giving a speech, as Russell Simmons said, they'll be rewarded with a free ticket aboard the Townhouse 3 Funk House into Spectrum City. He's accompanied at this point not by the wall of noise soon made famous by Public Enemy's producers, the Bomb Squad, rather we hear the sparse electronic sounds of 1983, a strutting electronic beat that pops, thumps and pings with determined circularity. Intermittently, there's the rattle of a fair box and Chuck's accomplices whispering in counterpoint his sonorous boom aid the anticipation that we're building to a departure, a whispering sucky sucky now, sucky sucky now. The Townhouse Free's funk train, it seems, is going to be a thrill. Over the two years following his graduation, Chuck would write Public Enemy's debut LP, Yo Bum Rush a Show, while driving Nassau County's parkways and expressways on his messenger job. For now, though, he was still somewhat marginal in hip-hop, primarily a party MC on a suburban island the rest of New York barely even considered a rap underdog. That, of course, would dramatically change later in the decade. Yet this, if any, is the moment from which all that flows. Nelson George rightly views hip-hop's early development in the Bronx as embodying a teenage black in a city grace under pressure, a set of approaches to creativity, fun, aspiration and self-fashioning in which the post-industrial New York of the urban crisis was constitutive, a because of, not in spite of. I'm not the first to point out this involves a brilliantly outlaw inversion. The challenged inner city product of structural racism emerges as a badge of pride via hip-hop's collective genius. In hip-hop's worldview, the inner city becomes a zone of belonging, an emblem of rugged resilience, and an impetus to creativity in every part of life. Hip-hop was and is, to use George's evocative term, the most self-consciously ghetto-centric of genres. I want to suggest that Long Island, by the early 1980s, had emerged as a kind of symbolic anti-Bronx, both in the culture at large, where it was emblematic of white success in the American dream, and more implicitly in hip-hop. In a 1981 piece describing the moors of New York's rap scene, George makes the contrast explicit. Quote, the regular audience is composed of teens and young adults, college students and office workers, in sasson jeans and sneakers getting loose. Dreams of upwardly mo upward mobility spin in their heads, but reality says that many will visit, a, visit Attica Prison 
or the unemployment line, Long Island and two Cadillacs is more than a few miles away economically, if not physically. As George here hints, Long Island was an unknowable place beyond for hip-hop's imagined geography that was seen through the prism of the winners of the suburban dream. 92% white, 82% home-owning, and 84% single-fam homely residing. Nassau County's median capita per income was $21,000 in 1983 when Chuck D boarded the Townhouse 3's funk train. In Bronx County, it was $11,000. If the Bronx had epitomised the inner cities, the 1968 Kerner Commission warned would become a separate but unequal black America by the 1980s. Long Island was its white and prosperous other, the destination of inner New York's white flights, the beneficiary of its lost tax dollars, and the Arcadian le leisure land for the, for the New York middle classes envisioned by Robert Moses, whose Cross Bronx Expressway tore a totemically careless rupture through the working class Bronx life in the 1950s. This left black Long Islanders in an ambivalent position and in any real sense invisible, not only were they frequently racistly miscast as ghetto dwellers by white neighbours, they were also misperceived by many black New Yorkers, as we have discovered, as rich, when the reality of their lives was typically far more complex. When Chuck D arrived in Roosevelt at the tail end of the 352% black population growth of the 1960s, this 70% black village was neither rich nor poor. Its median income was around $1,000 above that of the nation. 25% of residents had government jobs, 46% were white collar workers, another 10% lived below the poverty line. In the scheme of America's embedded racial inequality, Roosevelt's distinct averageness might indeed have seemed a life of unimaginable privilege to many, especially those on the sharp end of inner New York's structural inequality. At the same time, however, as we've, see, as we've seen, Roosevelt was relatively much well off than pretty much every white community in Nassau County, which was the nation's third most wealthy in 1970. It's unsurprising then that hip hop's territorialism sometimes came tinged with antipathy to the suburbs. In 1988, when one then famous rapper first heard Wine Dance MC Rakim's futurist rap masterpiece, Follow the Leader, he stated, it might be cool for some folks, but kids on the streets of Brooklyn don't want to hear that mess. For him, follow the leader, was the sound of kids who, quote, grew up in areas where they could afford to buy all the latest records and study the tracks so they could make better jams. With views like these seemingly widespread, or worse still, a subsection of inner New Yorkers seeing Long Islanders as easy prey, EPMD's Eric Sermon later reflected, quote, It used to be nobody wanted to be from out here if you were into rap. If people asked you where you were from, you'd say I'm from Brooklyn. <laughs> um, <laughs> but by the time Long Island acts like public enemy, De La Soul, Rakim and EPMD had risen to the forefront of rap, the situation had switched. Now a DJ has to ask, is Strong Island in the house? Everyone wants to be from Strong Island because they know good rappers come from here. The work that Stephanie and Chuck D encoded at WBAU was crucial in forming that positively framed vision of Long Island. N41, the song on Stephanie's cassette, is a case in point. The first recording that was broadcast featuring Chuck D's voice, N41, was a Nassau black belt posse cut by Freeport's Townhouse 3. Chuck's fr funk train, it turns out, is actually the bus he catches every day to get to Adelphi, the N41. At the same time, it's a vibe-filled party that could just as easily be a wonderful, sweaty basement. A as a piece of sonic poetry, is particularly apt to its Long Island context. Produced by one of rap's great producers in waiting, Keith Shockley, the track's inventive conceit was to put the listener inside a sonically immersive ride on the N41, the standing room only bus route that connected 82% black Roosevelt to black neighborhoods in Hempstead and Freeport. These were, in Shockley's opinion, the three hottest towns in Nassau County. Quote, 
You could not be in your way, in our way and not ride that bus, he says. As Stephanie describes it, the five MCs create at the beginning of a track, quote, a scenario where they're getting on this bus, which is an actual bus that comes from Freeport called the N41. And like that era, they're playing their loud rap music at the back of the bus and the bus driver's yelling at them. You know, one of the bus passengers is yelling at them, telling them to turn it down. And then in defiance, they yell back, Long Island starts smiling, get up out your seat, because all we need is a funky drummer beat. Sonically, the funk train doesn't so much evoke the swift motoric of the Long Island Railroad, rather it rumbles and clatters at a more 75 cent tempo, suggesting the rattle trap buses Newsday described, quote, belching diesel fumes into the Nassau air. Shockley layers in. Oh, there, that's a Long Island bus, uh, era, um, era specific. Um, Shockley layers in the ambient sounds you would expect to hear on the bus, the driver calling out Long Island black communities as if they were stops, the small talk of passengers name-checking the food joints they're about to go to or hailing new passengers. A low-slung, loping bass line feels as if we're bobbing on busted suspension. As a concept, it's a remarkably taught and inventive way of imagining a Long Island hip-hop community into being. For one, it interpolates that community in the song. The figure of the M41 immediately puts the track at the intersection of the three Nassau communities that experienced the greatest black population growth of the 1960s, Freeport, Roosevelt and Hempstead. The route it travelled along accounted for 52.2% of the county's 90,000 black population in 1980. It would have been highly recognisable to listeners as a vehicle of local black conviviality. As a key artery for Nassau's nascent hip-hop network, the N41 connected everyone involved in the recording, and by 1984 the bus was by some accounts a thriving space for mobile hip-hop placemaking. As Butch Cassidy later told Wax Poetics, all the rappers would be in the back just busting. This homage to the route, to its personalities, and the back black populations it served, would become the first anthem of Nassau County hip-hop, despite the fact it never released a commercial release. Yet being a bus, it's also layered with a class politics, I'd argue, and arguably too with an echo of the civil rights po politics that helped create the space for this black suburbia to emerge in the first place. Of course, Rosa Parks can't help but come to mind when Tony Allen of the Townhouse 3 tells a new passenger, I got the front, you got to watch your back. But as a suburban hub of black life, these towns were dictated by the scale of the automobile. Bill Stephanie later reflected, Long Island black youth culture of that era, you couldn't live without transportation. Hempstead, Roosevelt, Freeport and Westbury, they're not within walking distance at all. On this level, the N41's very wieldness is a key part of its essence of Nassau. Yet it also isn't a car. During the 1970s, Long Island had had 55% more cars per capita than the nation as a whole. That's slightly more than two for every two for every household. The car was at once central in a pragmatic sense to Long Island life. And as Long, I Long Island writer Ron Rosenbaum suggests, it was also a key marker of social differentiation on an island where the class system had effectively collapsed in on itself with vast parts of its population middle class. Thus developed what Rosenbaum calls, quote, the great chain of car model status as a marker of mo micro-social differentiation. Yet not everyone could afford the two Cadillacs Nelson George projected onto Long Island. A 1985 survey found that Nassau's average bus user was among the 7% of Long Islanders that didn't own a car. They were typically males aged 21 to 34, that's our kind of heartland demographic here, with an annual income of $8,000. In 1985, the median individual income across Nassau was $23,000. The N41 clearly makes a case for the more proletarian black suburbia Hank Shockley had come to realise he was part of. As Stephanie views it, the bus is, quote, a hybrid because it's not the subway and bombing and tagging and that world of the inner city, but it's not your, 
it's not your corporate attorney dad just bought you a Benz for your 15th birthday, which he's kind of implicitly saying is kind of the case in somewhere like um, uh, Garden City. It's the unique space that's in the middle, that spot that Hempstead, that all of these towns really, socially, politically, economically, for those periods, occupied. Paul Gilroy has written beautifully about the automobile as a freighted emblem in black liberatory politics. And this is heightened by the historic context of Long Island. During the period when Robert Moses was envis envisaging the island's parkway system as a means for bourgeois white leisure, it was typically black men's labor as chauffeurs that facilitated the wealthiest residents' leisured mobility. Long Island built on wheels, therefore, might be said to be at the forefront of the politics of black automotivity. And so the aspirations articulated by these young black bus riders, I would argue, are inherently political. Wheels are everywhere on the N41. We're advised to forget the bus, hop, hop in a cab, 395 reading on the clock. Butch Cassidy, meanwhile, tells us he wants an $85,000 Rolls Royce. And we're told, too, that if we want to chill, chill Will in a new Seville, somebody say Mr. Bill. What emerges is a kind of emancipatory dream of a high life in Cadillacs and Rolls Royces, hewn in the solidarity of the leisured mobility they've collectively appropriated on the blackest of Long Island buses. Our vocal riders are proud to be from Long Island. They're not hiding it. They're talking about their experiences and their landmarks, but they're also doing it in a way that presents an alternative black vision of Long Island to the one that is assumed to be the white and wealthy one by the culture at large. The bus is black space, it's funky, convivial, proletarian, not bourgeois. It's at once a brilliant reimagining of community and the most subtle of coded pushbacks. Thank you. Wow, that was great. I was taking a furious notes. Um, we're doing a, our next Black History documentary is on <coughs> the great migrations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I was writing to my producers saying, how are we dealing with the migration mm -hmm. to the suburbs? And I've yeah. filmed this before in a series, a couple Black History series ago. Uh, a family that moved from Brooklyn to Long Island. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it, it's very much a part of the reverse migration. Mm -hmm. we go, when black people who had moved from the south to the north between 1910 and 1970 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. started to move out. Yeah. But we tend to think of reverse migration as the movement from north to south when they were moving north to south, but from inner city to the burbs, too. Yeah. Um, but just a, a couple things. The, um, you didn't, unless I missed it, talk about the class structure in the black community mm -hmm, in the mm -hmm. inner city. You know, we've always had yeah. classes, right? And that's very important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's not like these people went from being, you know, underclass to middle class. Yeah. They were middle class, probably. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, that's who moved, right? I mean. Yeah. And there were middle class people that kind of stayed as well and kind of were still part of, you know, they might have moved a couple of miles down the road or something, but they were still in the Bronx. Yes, what, yeah. right. That, they were middle class in the inner, wherever mm -hmm. they were moving from, they were middle class, and they found the new middle class. Mm -hmm. Instead of moving up, they moved this way. Is mm -hmm. that right, or am I wrong? Um, s sorry, say that last bit again. The socioeconomic yeah. status mm -hmm. of the black people who moved to, mm -hmm. what did you say, Hempstead? Yeah, Hempstead, um, Roosevelt, Roosevelt and, Uniondale, those kind of places. Right. What would, what would, before they moved from the inner city there, what was that? my bet is mm -hmm. they were middle class in the inner city. Yeah. They didn't become middle class when they moved to the burbs. No, they're, they're kind of... Where are they going to get that mobility, right? They're, they're kind of going up, right, from their parents might be working class, and then they kind of, you know, quite often these are people who have been in the army, right, in the kind of, um, maybe not in the Second World War, but in the, the Korean War kind of era. And they're kind of coming back, I mean, yeah, you know, I've, I've heard a few times that story where they kind of come back from the army and then they kind of find their way into some kind of job and work their way up and they kind of become middle class. And they're, you know, there's often this kind of outwards journey that goes from, say, Harlem, 
and then to Queens, and then from Queens to Long Island. I would just caution you mm -hmm. to remember that we were always a class stop away, as it were, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? If you had a job as a post, working in the post office, in the black, that was a big fucking deal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You were in the middle class in the black community, even if you yeah. weren't in the middle class in the white community. Yeah. So that when you talk about um, having the aspiration to own a house mm -hmm. with, a, as you put it, a garage at, at street level, mm -hmm. right? And you could and have your little Volkswagen out. I would bet that they were middle class already. You see what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. That I just don't want. Um, I think it would be, I would be surprised, I'm trying to find the right way to say this. I would be surprised if they weren't middle class already. Yeah. That it's the assumption that they became middle class when they go to Long Island. I think oh, that no, that's I, I, right. I, I, I kind of, maybe that's, a kind of, that's something I need to make more clear. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's not my supposition at all, that they kind of go to Long Island and become middle class. They're kind of right. becoming middle class and then going to... You, you, right, and it's the yeah. next logical step. Yeah. Please. And then, you know, like the, the home ownership, obviously that kind of, that kind of puts you in a different of course. boundary. That changes the of, whole, yeah. because then you can start to accumulate yeah. wealth, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the classic, that's what we, what did you say, Abby? No, I just, because it's possible in the suburbs to own a house. Yeah. yeah. Whereas in Brooklyn. Or mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. But it wasn't possible for us to own a house in the suburb because they wouldn't let us, right? And then yeah. they open exactly. up and let us. redlining and yeah. kind of. Yeah, and all of that. The other thing is, the, that only seventeen thousand mm -hmm. dollars. My my brother and I bought my parents a house in 1975 in Piedmont, West Virginia. It, it was a fabulous house, but it was in Piedmont, West Virginia, for twenty five thousand dollars. And I was thinking, God damn, we could have bought a nice house up in <laughs> Long Island. Well, I, I would say though, what happened between 1967? Should have could have bought two houses. <laughs> I, I, I would ask though. My brother's an oral surgeon. He had the money, not me. <laughs> You know, like what what happened in terms of inflation in t between 1967 and the mid 1970s? Because you're kind of like in the zone of the oil crisis and kind of everything like that by that point. So, you know, when you look at median incomes from 1970 and then median incomes in 1980, there's like a really big jump between between the two. So I'm kind of, I'd you know, I'd wonder what the the relative value of, of that. House. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, let me know. Yeah. <laughs> it make me feel better. I want it to be... Yeah, I, I want you to feel good about that decision. <laughs> um, the final thing is, mm -hmm. I mean, these were very middle-class people, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I mean, this for is the not most a part. suffering black... I mean, this is not a woe is me mm -hmm, black... Mm -hmm, I bet mm -hmm. if we interviewed their parents, mm -hmm. they'd say, get a life, you got a good life here, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. uh, would they or not? I'm just guessing. <sighs> I think some of them. I mean, some of them are, are kind of... You know, there, there is also this ambiguity about like what is middle class, right? In terms of, you know, there are people that is someone who's working on aircraft engines middle class, or are they kind of yes in the yeah, black community? In the I black would community, say yes, they are, yeah. right? Okay, so Being I mean, a mechanic, someone, someone like someone like Rakim, for instance, he grew up with a dad who was an aircraft engineer and a mum who middle, was, middle class. was an opera singer, basically. Well, that's so. Upper, I mean, that's I mean, like wow, the, that's totally. That's huge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Upper middle class. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think she was kind of like going and performing at Carnegie Hall or anything. But it doesn't but, matter. Yeah. You in can spell out, bro. Yeah. You can put you in the middle class. You know? mm -hmm. It's just, it would be good to talk to like Larry Bobo or associates, uh -huh, uh -huh. talk about social classes yeah. within the black community just so that you're, you're making that shift. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we are always, I just made that up about the one beat away. I don't know how else mm -hmm. to call it. But, I, I, I totally get what you're saying. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so. I mean, this when I when I something that people Chuck underestimate. D, yeah. The this, class differentials within mm -hmm. the race are underestimated, I think, by a lot of scholars. Yeah. I, th I think I think that's correct. And kind of, you know, when I was when I interviewed Chuck D a couple of weeks ago, he kind of he was talking about that that same thing basically. And so, people in Harlem owned cars. Mm -hmm. People couldn't buy houses, so they bought cars. They would buy cars and live in them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> that was the joke, right? Mm -hmm. But, I mean, you said something about the two Cadillacs in, the, mm -hmm. in Long in Island, the right? Way. yeah, yeah. But they had a Cadillac in Harlem, too, uh -huh. right? So that's something to be aware yeah. of as well. I'm a literary critic. I'm not a social scientist. But I do know a lot about class just from mm -hmm. my own experience. From life, yeah. As a black person in the black community. So um, 
just something to be considered. I loved your presentation. Thank it's great. Thank okay. you. Chris, what do you want? Want my microphone? Yes, please. Thank you. <laughs> it was great. Thank you. Well done, James. Thank you. Um, I can hear your journalism background in the structure of the piece, and it works really well. Um, I think following somewhat on Skip's question, for me, I'm interested, I think there's a lot to be said about the distinctions between the kind of mythology of the inner city MC mm -hmm. and the development of the suburban MC and how they kind of took the form by storm in this period and it, through De La Soul. But then De La Soul also, right, becoming part of native tongues and mm -hmm. the, in the ways in which the boroughs merged at mm -hmm, a certain mm -hmm. point in the historical trajectory. So I'm interested in hearing you say what is not so different between them, right? Because I think there's a lot to be made of, mm -hmm. well, this is suburban or like the later iteration of the backpack rapper, right? Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. I think there's a lot to be said that distinguishes them, but what brings them together? Because part of what I heard Skip saying too is in relationship to the ways in which cla the black communities in the inner city were already class rich, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. They were already diverse, already multi-scaled in these spaces that are so-called inner city that have been deeply, deeply pathologized as much mm -hmm, as black mm -hmm. suburbia has been yeah. pathologized, right? Yeah. So what are those things that are holding them together? What's not, what, what's been made a big deal that is actually not that big a deal? Because these are spaces where people are living in dense proximity to each other. These are deeply black spaces. Mm -hmm. And it may not be the common sense that a place like Strong Island would be that, but it is the case, which is not so different than a Harlem or a Brooklyn, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that you're seeing all of the intra-racial diversity playing out in the ways in which people are uh, using meter, using rhyme, the kinds of sampling they're doing, et cetera. So what are the things that are being made a big deal that actually draw these kinds of distinctions into further blurriness in the historiography. Second question is to ask you to speculate. What happened in the few minutes of the blackout on Long Island? I think, okay, that one first. I mean, Chuck D literally said to me that the blackout happened, he remembers it happening and the lights went out and like, seven minutes later, or a kind of similarly small amount, number of minutes later, the lights came back on again. So I don't think anything probably happened beyond people just kind of going, oh, the lights have gone out. Um, you, you can, but you don't, if you don't know that the lights are coming, aren't coming back on, you might not have the kind of, you know, that moment where you just break out and kind of think, I'm going to take advantage of this. So, but yeah, I mean, completely, there were, um, you know, there were, I mean, I guess this, this folds onto your other question, really, which is, you know, if there, there was crime and kind of dysfunction in suburban black communities in Long Island, I mean, Rakim, you know, came from this, um, this, this kind of, background where he had like a, a you know quite a lot of cultural capital he had he was nurtured he had you know he was playing saxophone in band he was kind of you know engaged by his parents enough that he was kind of getting influences from John Coltrane in his own music approach to music and stuff so he you know he had all of this kind of cultural capital but by his own omission he was a stick-up kid when he was a teenager so he was kind of you know he was basically just kind of running around doing all the same things that you're, you're, you're kind of led to believe would be happening in quote unquote the hood. And so, you know, there, there are all these kind of proximities and kind of um, interweavings. And then, you know, obviously, I mean, my, I can use the example um, from, from my own life of my wife who grew up in, in the South Bronx. Um, but she, she grew up in what was basically a middle class um, private apartment complex. And, you know, I've heard people, I've had conversations with people who, within hip hop who have referred to that space as the hood, as if it's kind of like Bronx River houses or something. 
But the way her family talks about that place is like, oh, you know, the teacher lived next door, I was an accountant, like then upstairs it was like the postal worker, you know, it was like middle class space. So, yeah, I, I, I think there are, are so many kind of over, overlaps that kind of, um, you know, I, I've, there's this article, um, I can't remember who wrote it, but there's um, the, the building that Cool Herc threw his first party in, routinely assumed to be kind of like quote unquote hood. Apparently that was like built as middle income housing and was still middle income housing at that moment in time. And you know, they were, they, they were kind of like a hard working family from the Jamaican diaspora. And there were tons of families all over New, New York's inner boroughs who were in exactly the same kind of situation. So I think, you know, yes, there are those 45% um, um, poverty rates in somewhere like Morrisania in 1980, but that's kind of, that, that, you know, that's, that's concentrated, right? And then, you know, you know to, to bring it back to your point about, you know, De La Sola kind of going and joining forces with tribe and everything, you know, like if you look at Fife's background, for instance, he, he was a product of the same kind of family background, essentially, as almost all of these people that I'm talking about. They were, you know, they were artistically engaged. They were kind of middle class. And, you know, his mum was a poet, right? So it's really easy to just kind of assume. I mean, this is one of my bugbears about the way hip hop's written about anyway, which is this kind of assumption that everyone is kind of of the street, as it were. Thank you so very much, Hi. James, for this brilliant lecture. And I have to admit, I really didn't know a lot about hip hop at all before coming here. So between uh, the, the opening of the gallery, the concept Saturday in your lecture, I learned so much. My head is just wheeling. Um, I have three different quick questions. Well, I don't know if they're all equally quick. The first is very quick. If we're talking about this is a lot of a suburban turn, and I'm envisioning these houses mm. that you showed us pictures. And as far as I've learned, aerosol art is one of the major elements of hip hop. Can I, I was just, just interrupt you really quickly. Yeah. That's not actually my um, working title. That's like okay. a really old working title. Oh, so, okay. um, but I mean, yeah. it's like on, on the island, the kind of houses uh -huh. that you had. I was mm -hmm. just envisioning, did these kids engage in uh, aerosol art at all? And didn't that then have huge backlash from their parent, from their black middle class uh -huh. parents? Uh -huh. Well, number one. Number two is um, uh, one thing that is, is kind of my um, impression is that of all the different, lots of different types of musics I know, hip hop seems to be the most exclusionary when it comes to women. Mm -hmm. Very, very few women, lots of sexism. I mean, gangster rap has a lot of sexist lyrics anyway. And then also at the, the, um, the hip hop, festival on mm -hmm, Saturday and mm -hmm. we talked about this before you know of the 10 people on stage you had one woman and when you look at the financial revenues male artists male hip-hop artists like Ice-T have you know almost a hundred hundred million dollars the few female rappers their net worth is nowhere near that so, and I was wondering first of all if you can say a word why that is and why there has never been sort of some sort of um female music, hip hop culture really emerging or, or other female, typically female from the hood kind of music impression. And the other is if there is any difference in that regard between the more sort of um, middle class based hip hop and the hip hop from the Bronx or the hood or something. Okay. okay. Um, and, and I'll leave it at that. Man. Okay. I don't want to uh, in terms it. of graffiti, um, I believe there was graffiti. Um, there, I, you know, I've got, I, I'm this kind of weird person who has lots of scans of yearbooks of high schools in places like Roosevelt and stuff from the 80s. And there's, in one of them, there's actually a photo of um, someone doing, like standing by a big piece that's on the high school wall kind of thing, which I would bet they weren't kind of meant to do. Um, 
um, because it was kind of like very much like a, a messy throw up kind of thing. So it wasn't the kind of thing that you would commission someone to do. Um, so yes, the, you know, that happened just as it happens kind of in all sorts of other middle class communities. I mean, I, I kind of grew up a middle class kid. I had kind of friends who I'm not going to name who um, <laughs> did that kind of stuff. And, you know, it's, it's kind of, um, you know, they're, they're, they're menaces anywhere, right? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I'm sure that, I mean, I, I don't know the answer to your question it, beyond the fact that it happened. I'm sure that just as if I was doing graffiti and, my par- and I got caught and my parents found out, I'd have probably, I don't know, I don't know what they would have done, but I wouldn't have been kind of very well received. <laughs> Um, I, you know, exactly the same thing I'm sure would happen there. So, um, yeah. And then the, okay, so does that answer that part? Sure. Okay, next part. Why, that you, you've kind of asked me a really big question that I don't actually know the answer to again, which is why haven't female rappers made as much money as male rappers? Okay, um... <laughs> Thank you. I, I would say um, sexism, um, structural sexism. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, I, I would caution you about looking at Ice T's val- net value and thinking that's to do with his rap career. I would imagine that like a, the vast majority of that is money from being an actor. Um, and a lot of those rappers made precisely that transition because they had shitty record contracts and they weren't making any money so I I would you know there are there are you know I've had people tell me about people who obviously I'm not going to name because this is on camera and stuff who were like big rap stars and had like such bad record contracts that they they just had no money basically they were they you know they might as well have been um you know working minimum wage or something for for what they were actually having to operate their lives on after things have been like various things have been recouped from their advances and things like that so there is that and then I would say I bet Queen Latifah's made quite a lot of money um I bet that there are quite a lot of women rappers now who are, who are making more money than a lot of the male rappers at the moment but that's a relatively recent thing um so yeah i mean it's hip hop is inher- you know it, it inherently kind of a a culture that is very masculinist and in parts like highly sexist um so you know this is all you know there was a th- when i was a teenager I'll, I'll give you this perspective when i was a teenager growing up there's always this kind of normative thing of like a woman rapper being okay for a woman rapper rather than, you know, that's not an attitude that I had, but that was like absolutely normative within like popular cultural discourses around hip hop was like, you know, the assumption that women rappers weren't kind of good and that therefore if there was one that was quite good, they were kind of okay for a woman, but you wouldn't like, you wouldn't want to kind of put them next to KRS-One or someone like that. That was the kind of normative kind of assumption because it's like a teenage, you know, it was a teenage boys kind of culture forged in the image of teenage boys. And like, you know, Public Enemy, for instance, were older. They were kind of actual men when they became stars. So like by the late 1980s, they were, kind of what like 28 29 kind of age and um there was kind of some stuff in their lyrics which you can kind of read as like a a little bit kind of sexist but they you know they weren't running around calling women kind of a word that i'm not going to use here in front of everyone um or or ever (laughs) thank you um, okay. James, uh, yeah. look at the camera and give Mike Weaver your email address, would you? 
Where, oh, jmcn1000 at yahoo.co.uk. The miracle of technology. So he, he's watching and he emailed me and he said, um, um, he had a picture of, I mean, he has his address, which was 147 Rhodes Drive in Hempstead. And then he said, Aunt Sarah did day work while her husband bartended on um, the same white Long Island family parties, right? So they were in the middle class, but you mm-hmm, wouldn't think mm-hmm, mm-hmm. somebody doing day work at a bartender mm-hmm. would constant the middle class. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So he's got pictures of him and all this. Oh, wow. Yeah. Good looking couple from the, after the military. Yeah. So maybe, uh-huh. you know, there you go. That is meant for you. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. I didn't know when I became the repository for reactions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever the hell got my email address and you erase it. <laughs> um, questions, okay. comments? Yeah. Oh, you, can I ask a question? Oh, yeah, yeah of course. Uh, so I'm a historian, and, uh-huh. I, and I, I'm, f- first of all, thank you very much for that lyrical, beautiful, elegant presentation. It, mm-hmm. You know, it really, your presentation has soul. Or does it have hip hop? <laughs> Either is anyway, fine. Anyway, so. um, A little so. So my, my question is mm-hmm. a typical uh, a question that a historian might ask. I'm completely ignorant of his hip hop and, 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 and the scholarship about mm-hmm, hip hop. Mm-hmm. What you presented here seems to be a very kind of layered uh, um, uh, essay that mm-hmm, incorporates mm-hmm. family, uh, real estate, class, I mean, it's really, I mean, it, uh, intersection, there's all these elements to it. So my question is that what is, what is the historiography of hip hop in the last 20 years look like? Um. Uh, I mean, in other words, how, 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 how what, I mean, what, what kinds of, okay, let me ask you a different, what kinds of things have, have uh, historians of hip hop been talking about in the last? Um, I mean, years? the last. I, I would say, like the last ten years, there's just been like a, because all the the foundation histories, there are like fifteen different versions of everything, right? So, if you want a book about the origins of hip hop in the Bronx, there's like a million books. So, people are beginning to realise that there's like a limited market for more of those. So a lot of people have been right, you know, there have been several books about um, women in hip hop released over the last kind of few years. There are books about hip hop in in particular cities in the South. There are books about hip hop like in relation to um, the, the urban crisis in Los Angeles or the suburban crisis in Los Angeles. Um, so there are all, all kinds of um, topics that are being, you know, it's wide open, basically. Okay. Thank you. No, it's <laughs> Thanks for your presentation, James. Thank you. Um, uh, th- I, I don't think this is a question. It's just a quick comment. Mm-hmm. And I think that even if it ends up being a footnote, it would be great if you could look at and think a bit about the history of um, race and space in New York in the 19th century because there actually oh. is this similar history uh-huh. because you know I'm like very much enmeshed in 1850s black Brooklyn and uh-huh. what's happening okay. that moment because of the state law in order to vote you have to own property mm. so in this period people are moving further and further out buying up because they can afford land further and further out so there's a great book by Judith Wellman on Weeksville there's just some you know, in terms of that question of historiography, a really good um, historiography around property ownership and, and um, African American life in the 19th century that I think mm-hmm. parallels, in a really interesting way, some of the things that interest you about these questions of suburbanization, Which is, including folks going to Long Island. Uh, what, this is what I was about to say because, like, Hempstead has had, um, you know, a black a black population for like hundreds of years, right. basically. So and those movements become like mm-hmm. really interesting hubs of like mm-hmm. social and cultural life. So again, even if it's so just a around, little prehistory or a, a footnote, I think it could be an yeah, interesting yeah, definitely. Back history I, I completely book. agree. Um, you know, in, in in both Freeport and Hempstead, you've got kind of um, like enclaves of kind of somewhat 
wealthy black entertainers and stuff happening in the kind of, from the early 20th century and stuff like that. So there's probably similar kind of flows going on in the period you're talking about, I think. But yeah, point me in the direction of some stuff. I'd really kind of um, appreciate that. Is it my go? Hey. Cool. Um, thank you so much, James. As you know, um, you know, I grew up on Long Island, mm -hmm. one town over from Rock Rakim during this time period. So it just hit really home to see mm -hmm, these images mm -hmm. and, and hear some of these narratives. Um, and real quick, in response to your question, I would argue that all those same things are true in America in general, right? Like mm -hmm, mm -hmm, in employment, mm -hmm. in sports, right? We still hear the, like, yeah. for a girl, she's good at whatever. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I just think it's not like a rap issue. It is this country. A society issue. Uh, it's yeah. society, yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, I would agree. So your, this presentation made me think a lot about the idea of an inherent, inheritance. Mm -hmm. um, and especially I was thinking about Bakari Kitwana's definition of the hip-hop generation, right? And circa, yeah. the book came out in 2002, so like he probably wrote it in like 1999. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and how he defined the hip-hop generation as essentially the children of civil rights folks, right? Yeah. Um, and specifically talked about how they had sort of inherited the failures of the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. the things that didn't go well, sort of the yeah, turn yeah, yeah. towards mass incarceration, um, you know, the crack epidemic on, on all different mm -hmm. like spectrums of it. And I just appreciate how you capture this other side of it, because he doesn't really talk about these folks, mm -hmm. right, in describing the hip hop generation. It's sort of, as you said, this like kind of forgotten, invisibilized community. Um, and this idea of promise is what came through a lot in what mm -hmm. you shared, right? Sort of geographically, um, socioeconomically, the promise of jobs and employment and college and futures. Um, and then specifically within sort of hip hop culture, a lot of the quotes you read were about like the future and these promises and this mm -hmm, hope. Mm -hmm. And I wonder in your research, I know it was more focused on this time period, but if mm -hmm. you've had a chance, especially visiting Long Island since yeah, you've yeah. been here, um, to see how that, what are the outcomes of those promises, both within hip hop culture, like how has that mm -hmm. turned out? What are the inheritances of this generation? So like the children of mm -hmm. the Rakims and the Method Mans and the Busta Rhymes, those folks who were in Long Island in that time period, um, and more specifically around socioeconomic status, like how has that kind of shifted? How have these promises played mm -hmm. out? Is that a clear question? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, the first thing I would say is that. You know this, this, this kind of the people that I'm talking about today. They're like a like an in between generation, right? They're not hip hop generation. They're kind of they're of the generation that are inventing hip hop. You know, like so they're all basically all the same age. I mean, Chuck D and the the Boxley brothers probably kind of the same age as Grandmaster Flash and maybe a little bit younger than Cool Herc, but like only a whisker younger, basically. So they're. They're in this, you know, Bill Stephanie describes them as a generational bubble, right? They're, they're coming of age under the, under the benefits of civil rights, and then, like, they're adults by the time crack happens. So that's not kind of, that, that's never impacting their environment as a young person the way that it, Im, it, that, that it impacts someone like Rakim, who's eight years younger than them. So Rakim's like, there's this, basically there's this, this kind of, this, this little kind of generational kind of micro section that a lot, of the, a lot of the people that were rap stars in the late 80s come from. You know, they're all born around 1968, 69. Like so many of them are in that little kind of bubble. Then De La Soul may be like a, a fraction younger. Um, and and they're, they're kind of coming of age in, in a different kind of suburbia in a way. And I, and I do write about this in my book that I haven't written yet. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, basically, like, the, the, you know, the, the, the difference between the communities that, that I'm talking about as a community in 1980 and then what they look like by 1989... Is, is like there's so much, so much bad stuff has happened, right? Because they're, they're not insulated from, you know, Long Island isn't insulated from crack. Crack is happening on Long Island. And of course, it's happening in black communities because they're kind of, le you know, they're, they're just left to kind of have not as many resources. So you've got, you get kind of um, like drug front lines in North Amityville, <coughs> Wine Dance all of these communities, maybe not so much in Roosevelt, but definitely kind of in Hempstead, there were, were kind of areas where crack was being sold and stuff. And, 
you know, they're the so these these are kind of, you know they, it enters a really really precarious funny time in that period where you know that thing about the two jag, jaguars that that's kind of still there, but then there might be like then like you know that person's kids might be vulnerable to kind of get involved in crack sales and stuff. So you know the uh, and then you've got kind of greater unemployment by the late 80s as well. You've got, you know, all of these different factors are kind of coming into play in that moment that you see as the, the you know, within all of hip-hop's narratives, all of the things that people are talking about in the late 1980s happening in the Bronx or Brooklyn or wherever, there's, there's a permutation of it happening on Long Island as well. So that these, these shifts are kind of hitting everyone. You know, I couldn't help but think of as you talk, seeing all the the um, artists on the stage mm -hmm. on Saturday, and I wonder if anyone's done a net worth study mm -hmm. of the different generations of hip hop. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, in the same way, if some of the greatest basketball players mm -hmm. and football players made nothing, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. compared to what people make now. Yeah. Um, um, and then there, um, just tremendous differential. Nas and niece graduating from Harvard. Mm -hmm. within last year, right? Mm -hmm. Or two years ago. But on the other hand, I'm sure someone in Nas' generation of hip-hop artists, you know, his niece is that, or granddaughter is mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Which is so tricky, like you said. You said, oh, yeah. he graduated from Cornell. Or other yeah, 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 he did. Yeah. His yeah. son did. Mm -hmm. But there was a lot of lament about, yeah. remember, yeah. it was a lot of structured ag agency conversation on that mm -hmm. stage. Mm -hmm. was it, I see kept saying it was our fault to some extent because mm -hmm. we signed contracts just to get fifty thousand dollars or twenty thousand dollars, and we didn't have good advice. Um, yeah, it's just it's just, just the same as Chuck Berry getting a car for yeah. right. It's the same the same thing just gets played out in different stories. ways. Yeah, yeah, we don't get what we like. These these people who are geniuses, right? They're in their field. They're geniuses. They're brilliant, and they they what they do creates so much value, and they kind of just get you know taken advantage of because they're young when they're doing... Well, I've heard people argue about Barry Gordy. Barry Gordy mm -hmm. would take um, artists and, you know, buy them a house and give them mm -hmm. a, uh, a stipend, you know, a monthly uh, a check, right? Yeah. Which was a big deal, except the upside, mm -hmm. they didn't get mm -hmm. any upside. Yeah. And so Barry lives in, you know... Barry yeah, they, ha they haven't got any of the back, back end, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's complicated. Yeah. Yeah, it's really kind of... Um, yeah. We got time for one final because we have to have a photograph. Well, I, I guess that's me then. <laughs> um, no, no pressure. Um, Better be a good one. <laughs> well, it's re it, part of it is related to some of the conversations um, around class that uh -huh. you brought up, which was not actually my initial question. Um, but I, I appreciate uh, the way in which you've worked to add some texture um, to the discussion of class and to, to think about precariate, uh, not only uh, sort of the precarity of middle classness, mm -hmm. um, but its contingency and, and contextuality, the, the idea that um, they were reminded of the second classness mm -hmm, of their mm -hmm. middle classness often um, was something that I felt you know, that I could relate to. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking specifically about the idea of like attending um, Adelphi out of, on a four year full ride scholarship, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the experience of opportunity being um, one that can also um, put a person in a, in a situation where they are reminded of why they need that opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and thinking about some of the observations folks have made about um, the specificity of black middle classness in the United States, that while there's class stratification, I think there also tends to be, or at least this is certainly true of the United of New Orleans, and I wondered if it was true in Long Island, of um, more interclass kind of connection community, such that you can be a kid from the projects going to a sort of elite black Catholic school. Mm -hmm where you would be attending school with folks who yeah. you perceive as rich, mm -hmm. while you are clearly a kid who is perceived yeah. as poor. And so there's sort of moments of touch, um, I would say more opportunity for there to be sort of connections and, uh -huh. and relationships 
between these classes, and I'm wondering kind of how that's playing out in Long Island. I mean, I think I think that's happening all the time, right? I mean, people are people are getting, you know, Chuck D was getting bussed up to um, W. Trespa Clark High School, which is in like a very well-to-do white area of Westbury. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I kind of actually know someone who was on that bus with him every day going from Roosevelt to, um, to that community. And like the, you know, the, there was just like, a, you know, neither of them were like poor or from the projects, right? They're kind of from these kind of middle class, but not like massively stable kind of middle, financially middle class. And they're, and they're kind of daily going into this environment, which is kind of full of like what you would term rich kids, basically. Um, so they're, 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 they're constantly... Are they rich black kids or are they rich white kids? I was just curious. Okay, rich white kids, yeah. yeah. Like, so I you mean within... Even, yes. Okay, right. My dad is an example. He okay. grew up in the projects. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But went to St. Og High School with kids who... Some of them went to the, grew up in the projects. Some of them would yeah. have been I mean, very within, solidly black middle class for generations. Within Billy even, <laughs> yes, but he was. But my dad was like a first generation mm -hmm. in his family to go to college. Period, yeah. where he would have been going to college with other black kids who were uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. their families had yeah. gone to college for yeah, generations. Yeah. Again, yeah, I think that that was like maybe. Not in the context, I, I don't know about the context you're talking about, but in, um, I can give you the example of, um, you know, in, in Freeport, there was this, um, there was this like lit, this housing project that was basically like created as an island in this kind of area that was zoned for industrial use, basically. And then, you know, it, it's like literally kind of um, maybe six in, interconnected four story brick. Um, apartment buildings and they're just there and like then you know there's all this stuff around them and then the houses are like off over there kind of thing and a few of the people that were involved in the stuff around the um, WBAU radio station at Adelphi were from that environment so they're you know they're they are fr I mean I don't know what they're you know, I've, I haven't interviewed any of those people yet, so I don't, you know, I wouldn't like to speculate on what their economic situation was, but they're, they're kind of living in this kind of, what's perceived as this kind of island of hood within Freeport. Yeah, I just think it would and, be something to like pay mm -hmm. attention to, to yeah, yeah, think yeah, about definitely. even for the, the folks who you're thinking of as being mm -hmm. black middle class. Are they black middle class kind of all in the same way? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> um, I mean, uh, that, this is... I mean, this is what this is what I'm. But even new black middle class, there's kind of striations, oh, right? Oh, it's always because, precarious. <laughs> because yeah, yeah. you know, you've got um, you know, I, you know, this, you know, Bill Stephanie's middle class with his dad with an executive job at um, at Sports Illustrated is a different middle class to to kind of Chuck D's black yeah, yeah. middle class with his mum working as a receptionist at Roosevelt High School and his dad basically kind of doing trucking type stuff. So that's, there's a kind of a big, a big difference there, right? But also are probably all perceived quite similarly mm -hmm. from like but, by the white kids they went to school with. Exactly, but I would also say all of these people have got members of their family in the Bronx, in Harlem, who are yeah. in, in like kind of the situations sure. that we would think of as the inner city, right? Yeah, or, or even in jail. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And the last thing so is just it's, the, it's, you know it's really kind of quick mm -hmm. observation that like you've signed and locating quick. this into lo lo very very quick okay. in Long Island, and that's just that site seems super specific both mm -hmm. on the larger geographic mm -hmm. issue and like then these kind of micro sites like the mm -hmm. N forty one bus like Adelphi University mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I just. I was really drawn to the parts of your presentation that were so site rooted mm -hmm. and just thinking about organization that's maybe a particular I'm wondering what are these other sites besides the university besides the bus oh, okay. um, that you might think about kind of using as a structural through line or a, yeah. a way of thinking about the importance of place yeah. in your work. All right, was that quick enough for you? Quick enough. <laughs> you Thank you very much. Later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Come, let's get our photograph. Children. That was 
great. It's, it's, it's amazing. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like, I'd Come like. On.